right now. Well, tonight we're going to continue with our study of Paul's second letter or epistle to the Corinthian church. Um, this topic, we've covered it in different ways in the past, but we really are going to be talking about de death of a believer, what happens after the death of a believer. But mostly we're going to emphasize Paul's written instructions or comments to the Corinthian church about this subject. I titled this subject, What Are You Planning to Do After Your Funeral Is Over? And that most people don't think of that, but I will relate as I will more fully describe. I met a gentleman last week when I was away from the office who was planning all the arrangements for his funeral. And I don't know what prompted me to ask him. He'll say, well, what are you going to do after your funeral? And he looked at me in a puzzled face. And I said, well, you know that when you die, you still exist. What plans are you making so that you can exist with God? And he said, well, I never thought of it that way. And I said, well, maybe you ought to think about these things. Well, Paul did think about what arrangements need to be made during our lifetime for what we're going to do after we die. And so that's why I come up with the topic. We're going to look at half of chapter 5, verses 1 through 11 of Paul's second epistle to the Corinthians. We're going to go back to Ecclesiastes 12, verses 1 through, I think it should be 1 through 8, but and then Hebrews 11, verses 24 through 27. Now, it's been a couple of weeks since we've had our study on the book of Corinthians. But in previous lessons, if you recall, we emphasized Paul's persistent, uncompromising dedication to sharing the gospel with unbelievers and concluded our lessons with the statement that to Paul it was the gospel, the whole gospel, and nothing but the gospel. Now in chapter 3 of Paul's second letter to the Corinthian church, Paul distinguished the fading glory of the Old Covenant the Old Testament, of death from the unfading eternal glory of the new covenant of life in the New Testament. Paul really described the Old Testament law as something that, while it had its glory, just like Moses' face fade, faded when he was away from the Lord, this Old Covenant was intended to fa be faded away and replaced by the new covenant of life. Paul wrote that those who believe in Christ as their source of salvation received the Holy Spirit, which empowered them to fulfill the law of the Old Testament or the Old Covenant, which was otherwise impossible to achieve by human efforts. As sinful In our sinful nature, it is totally impossible for us to fulfill perfectly the Old Testament law, um, no matter how hard you try. And if we, if you remember our study of Martin Luther, um, he, before he really realized that salvation comes by faith and from the grace of God, he tried his very best to be the perfect, obedient uh, servant to the law. And it led to frustration. It led to him constantly going to confessions. It, it led to the point that he never he began to say that he didn't even love God because it was just too hard for him to fulfill all these requirements but just like Paul is describing to us in these chapters Martin Luther discovered that it's by what Christ did that we receive our salvation and only through the work of the Holy Spirit in the believer's heart are we able to even begin to fulfill the requirements of the law now, because the false teachers or Judaizers were telling the Corinthians that their salvation and righteousness required them to be obedient to the law of Moses, Paul emphasized to the Corinthians that their salvation, their righteousness, and their glory was achieved by the Holy Spirit sent by Christ, who fulfilled the requirements of the law, and who through the Holy Spirit gave them the power to obey the law and to receive glory and righteousness, which they could not receive through their own efforts. 
In chapter four, Paul discussed his own experience of living in darkness under the law without recognizing Jesus as a Messiah who is foretold and promised in the Old Testament scriptures. Christ was promised in the Old Testament and the Old Covenant pointed to Christ as the one that would bring salvation and eternal life. It was always God's plan. It was ne God never intended that the Old Testament and the Old Covenant would be the means of salvation. The Old Testament pointed to Christ. Christ fulfilled the requirements of the law in the Old Testament. And through God's grace and raising Jesus from the dead, we can receive by grace, not by works, our salvation. Recognizing the mercy which Jesus had given to him, especially in light of Paul's persecution of the early church, Paul considered the message of salvation from the new covenant as being more important than his own life. We're going to see how chapters 2, 3, and 4 of his second epistle lead into what we're going to talk to tonight about in chapter 5. Paul recognized the mercy shown to him when Jesus called upon Paul to preach the new covenant of salvation through Christ, who removed the veil of darkness from his mind and delivered into his heart the light of the knowledge of the glory of God manifested through Jesus Christ. Chapter 4 was about the veil that kept the non-believer in darkness. And only through the Christ and the Holy Spirit is that veil lifted. We talked when in chapter four, we talked about when Paul went to Ananias and was uh, who laid hands on Paul under the direction of God, that scales fell from Paul's eyes, removing the veil of darkness and replacing it with the veil, uh, with, with the light of the knowledge of the glory of God manifested through Jesus Christ. From the moment of his conversion, Paul considered his own body of flesh as nothing and the gospel message that he was sent to preach is everything. While all the other apostles called by Christ to preach the gospel of salvation suffered persecution, and for the most part, a martyr's death, Paul himself experienced a level of persecution, deprivation, pain, and suffering, which only a few would ever be able to endure. When you think about all the things that Paul went through, and we think about what we face as Christians in the United States today, what we face pales in comparison to the suffering that Paul experienced. Well, how did Paul endure such hardships without losing heart or giving up? Most of us would probably have given up, saying, I've had enough beatings, I've had enough persecution, jailings, shipwrecks, going without food, being exposed to the elements, being uh, rejected by people that he uh, loved and and brought to Christ in the church, most of us would say, enough is enough. I'm going to find a different way of making a living. So in the first part of chapter 5, Paul reveals the reason he was able to continue preaching the gospel while enduring the suffering and persecution without losing heart. Chapter 5 of Paul's second epistle to the Corinthian church is about a new body and eternal life which believers will receive when their physical bodies die and what Christ did to reconcile man to God. Tonight we're going to cover the first part which is that the new body that we will receive when we die. Next week we'll cover the second part is what Christ did to reconcile man to God. Paul wrote his two epistles to the Corinthian church from Ephesus. When Paul wrote these two letters Paul recognized that his own death was forthcoming. We're talking about Paul completing his missionary journeys. He's in Ephesus. He's going to leave Ephesus to go to Jerusalem. When he goes to Jerusalem, he's arrested. There is a plot where 40 assassins swear that they will not eat any food until they kill Paul. Yet Paul is taken by a Roman guard away from Jerusalem, ultimately after going through Roman proconsuls and, and, and governors, he ends up being shipped to Rome, where in Rome he is uh, held captive and writes and starts to write the prison letters. It's not long. Paul knows that he can't go on forever and that his life is on the downturn. He, he's lived the majority of his life 
and he writes his uh, these epistles knowing ultimately what his fate will be. Paul's message in chapter 5 is about our lives on earth being temporary and our lives after death being eternal. When Paul talks about our lives on earth and our lives after death, he is describing a physical body on earth growing old and dying and compares our temporary physical bodies to the eternal physical bodies which believers will receive after death. When Paul, Everything that Paul talks about, whether he describes it as a habitation, a tent, or a physical body, Paul is talking about our physical bodies on earth being replaced by our physical bodies in heaven. And that's something that Paul is emphasizing in this part of his epistle. Paul's message is a message of assurance that when believers die, they will receive a new physical body, which is eternal, and that in light of this assurance, believers should live out the remainder of their lives on earth without fear, and they should seek to please and serve Jesus. Paul's message in chapter 5 is most relevant to the members of our church, especially because most of us are experiencing the decaying and degeneration of our bodies and are facing the time when the Lord will call us into eternal life. Um, we're going to talk about groaning. Well, as we get older, when we start to move and our muscles hurt, we groan. Um, we don't sometimes realize how much we groan, but when you're around somebody who says, what's wrong? And you say, well, I, I'm just getting up. Well, they're saying, you're groaning like everything you're doing is hurting. Well, it does hurt. I <laughs> I went over and I dropped a piece of paper at the office today and I had to get out of my chair and get down on my knees and pick up this piece of paper. You would have think that I was taking uh, a task that of lifting a hundred pounds above my chest. It, it, I was groaning like, a, like I was 90 years old. So this message that Paul has for us tonight, he's speaking to us. He's speaking to us because we're in the category of people he's talking about. Now, I already mentioned that when I was traveling, I met a man who was planning his own funeral and I asked him what plans he was making after his funeral. Well, Paul in this, part of the fifth chapter of his epistle provides an answer to the question, giving us guidance on what we as believers should do in anticipation of our departure from our physical bodies and receiving our new eternal bodies when we die. The main message that I want you to get from tonight's lesson is that being given assurance by the Holy Spirit that he will in fact receive an imperishable, eternal, physical and glorious body when he dies, Paul considered his own earthly body as a fragile and perishing tent through which he devoted every single moment of his life to pleasing God in order to receive the prize of victory when he finished running the race. So what I broke what we're going to talk about in this part of chapter five into three parts. Our time on earth in our existing bodies is temporary. Second, as believers, we have assurance that upon death we will receive a new physical body which is eternal and that our time in eternity will be spent living in that body with God. Third, we're going to talk about this assurance should motivate believers to make the best use of their time on earth. Then we'll have some discussion questions which will expand our understanding of these scriptures. Well, let's get started. Our time on earth in, extra, in, in our existing bodies is temporary. Paul describes our, our earthly physical bodies as a tent. He says, starting in verse 1, For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. As a tent maker, Paul was familiar with the characteristics of a tent, which he used as a metaphor for our physical bodies in this world. Many in Paul's times were nomads who lived in tents, and they did not live in permanent dwellings or houses. Paul made tents for those who attended the Isthmus Games to temporarily reside in for the duration of the Games. The tabernacle was a temporary abode for God to dwell with his people until the Israelites established themselves in the Promised Land 
and built the temple as a more permanent abode for God to dwell with him. We live in what God uh, decreed to be a temporary tent. Now, a temporary tent, I was thinking about my own experiences. Not many of us have an experience of living in a tent for a long time. I can remember when I went to Germany and we were out in the field uh, testing the Palatins, the M109s at Hohenfels, we lived in tents for nine months. And I can tell you that it didn't take long for me to miss a shower, to miss all the comforts that go with being in a house. And I knew that the, temp the tent was temporary, but boy, it wasn't very pleasant either. So Paul's use of the word tent signifying our physical bodies um, is really an appropriate metaphor for him to use. Tents over time tear, they deteriorate, they start to leak rain, they start not to provide the shelter that you needed, and they're not designed to last forever. Even the nomads had to replace the tents that they traveled from place to place and, and replace them so that they could continue to live out in the desert. Using a tent as an illustration, Paul was emphasizing that in the same manner as a tent is used as a temporary abode, man's earthly existence in the body is frail, temporary, and over time deteriorates to the point it is no longer useful. Sounds like me, my body. I'm getting older. Um, the frailty of man's existence on earth is best described by Solomon in the last chapter of the book of Ecclesiastes. Solomon writes, talking to the young people, remember now your creator in the days of your youth before the difficult days come and the years draw near when you say, I have no pleasure in them. You get to a point where your life has no pleasure. While the sun and the light and the moon and the stars are not darkened and the clouds do not return after the rain. In the day when the keepers of the house tremble and the strong men bow down. Keepers of the house is our physical bodies. They, they tremble. They shake. Um, they bow down because they can't stand straight up. When the grinders cease because there are few, we lose our teeth. Pretty soon, you have more teeth on top and less on the bottom, and you can't chew like you used to. Your grinders cease because they're few in number, and those that look through the windows grow dim. dim. Our eyes, we can no longer look through the windows of our eyes because of cataracts and, and dim in vision and everything else. When the doors are shut in the streets and the sound of grinding is low, when one rises up at the sound of a bird, and all the daughters of music are brought low. Also, they are afraid of heights. I can't think of any more thing more scary as an older person than climbing a ladder. I'm afraid of heights. I used to clean windows 20 stories up on a building in Sacramento. I wouldn't dare do that today. And, the, and they're afraid of heights and terrors in the way. And th when the almond tree blossoms, the grasshopper is a burden and desire fails. For man goes to his eternal home and the mourners go about the streets. Then Paul, then Solomon writes to those that are older. He says, remember your creator before the silver cord is loosed, your spinal column is loose, or the golden, <clears throat> excuse me, or the golden bowl is broken, our head, or the pitcher shattered at the fountain, or the wheel is broken at the well. Then dust will return to the earth as it was, and the spirit will return to God who gave it. I can't think of a more apt description of our tent, our physical bodies, and it wasn't designed to be eternal and last forever. <clears throat> Paul contrasts the frailty of our physical bodies on earth to the perfect, glorified, and permanent house not made with human hands, which believers will receive when they die. In 2 Corinthians, he continues in verse 1, we have a building from God a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. <clears throat> when we die, we're going to get a new body. Unlike the old tent, it's not going to deteriorate. It's not going to be fragile. And it's going to be eternal. And it's going to be a physical body that's going to be made and provided to us by God himself. The building from God is used by Paul as a metaphor for the believer's physical, resurrected, and glorified body. 
Building implies a structure that is solid, permanent, and indestructible, contrasted to a tent which is frail, temporary, and subject to being worn out. Paul writes that in our temporary physical bodies, we groan as we age and grow weaker. In verses 2 through 4, Paul writes, For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. If indeed, having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we who are in the tent groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed that mortality may be swallowed up by life. And Paul talks about our habitation from heaven being clothed. He's talking about receiving a new physical body which clothes our spirits. In other words, when we die, we will not remain alive in the spirit only, unclothed, but will receive a physical glorified and eternal body so that we will not be found naked. Paul is basically saying, we're not going to be disembodied spirits when we die. We're going to be people with physical bodies that are going to clothe our spirit. So we're not going to be naked in a disembodied spirit. We're going to be clothed with a physical body. To Paul, our groaning is not only for our groans of despair as we decline in our strength and health in this earthly life and body, but also our groans looking forward to exchanging our frail and temporary physical bodies for a new glorified and eternal body. Paul longed to be set free from his earthly body and from all the sin, frustrations, and weaknesses experienced by his earthly body. Paul eagerly looked forward to receiving his glorified and eternal physical body when he died. Later in the second epistle to Corinthians, Paul is going to describe a man who had the opportunity to go to the third level of heaven. Well, Paul is really talking to about himself. We don't know exactly when this happened to Paul, but I submit that when Paul, Paul died while being stoned, he had this experience in death of being in heaven, realizing the physical body that he would see. And that Paul is, based upon this experience, Paul is very confident of what heaven's going to offer. And to Paul, he's absolutely positive, confident that he's going to have a physical body and that his physical body will be free from all of these sufferings that he's had in lifetime. Paul remained confident that believers would receive a real, eternal, resurrected body, and that upon death a believer would not be released into a spiritual body to live the next life as a disembodied spirit. I want to add a story that I'm reading about our sixth president, John Quincy Adams. And when he was older, and after he served as president, a person that was a friend of his said, Mr. President, how do you feel? He said, fine. The house is a little bit feeble. The, sh the tiles are being, are falling from the roof, and the foundation is weak. But Mr. Adams is fine. Mr. Adams believed in the afterlife. He believed that Mr. Adams would always be fine, no matter what happened to his physical body. The out of the house was getting all shaky and old, and the hair was falling off his head, and the foundation was shaky and flimsy, but Mr. Adams was fine. And so that's kind of what Paul's message is to us here. Now, as believers, we have assurance that upon death, we will receive a new physical body, which is eternal, and that our time in eternity will be spent living in that body with God. Paul writes in verses 1 through 8, we're going to repeat some of these verses again, for we know that our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed. We have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. If indeed, having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we who are in this tent groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed that mortality may be swallowed up by life. Now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has also given us the spirit as a guarantee. So we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. 
We are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. You can see that Paul is saying, I'm confident that we're, I'm going to receive this body. Believers should be confident. And the spirit is given as a guarantee that we'll receive the body. And when you look at the comparison, the body that we're going to receive is far in priority and preference to the body that we are going to discard when we die. To Paul, faith in Christ not only transforms the believer in this life, but continues into the next life when believers receive their new physical glorified body. Paul wrote that we walk by faith, not by sight. None of us, except by the witness of the apostles who saw the risen Christ, have seen the risen body of the believers. But by faith, by the promises of Christ, by the resurrection of Christ, we have assurance of that body that we cannot see that we're going to receive. And we walk by faith, not sight. And our faith is in Jesus Christ and, and Jesus Christ alone. It is the resurrection of Christ that assures us that we're going to receive this physical body because we will likewise receive a resurrected body. This faith in Christ gives us confidence or assurance that not only will we have life after death, but we will receive life in a new physical and glorified body. To Paul, death is a moving or transformation from a perishable temporary body into an imperishable glorified eternal body. Death and heaven is not a destination. It's a transformation. It's a movement. This faith is not based upon what we can see in the flesh, but is based upon what cannot be seen with our eyes in the and it's the same faith with Moses had looking forward to Christ's coming. Even before Christ appeared in bodily form, Moses looked forward to the salvation that Christ would bring to him. In Hebrews 11, in the chapter on faith, verses 24 to 27, the author of the Hebrews writes, By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter choosing rather to separate affliction with the people of God than to enjoy passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. For he looked to the reward. By faith, he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him, Christ, who is invisible. Moses looked forward to the invisible. Look forward to the promise. And Moses gave up every earthly pleasure you could possibly imagine. Pharaoh did not have a son. His daughter took Moses as a son. Moses was most likely in line to become the next Pharaoh in Egypt. He had in front of him all the pleasures, all of the power, all of the admiration of being a Pharaoh in Egypt. And if you look at how the Egyptians lived and how the pharaohs lived, they lived a pretty good life. But Moses sacrificed all of that. He forsook all of that. He forsook what he could see with his eyes for what he couldn't see and what Christ would bring to him in, a, in the reward of eternal life. Paul wrote that the Holy Spirit that we have received when we place our faith in Christ is a guarantee that we will receive a physical glorified and eternal body when we die. The Holy Spirit we receive from God, it's like a down payment, which gives us assurance of what we will eventually receive. When we know that we're going to inherit something and our parents give us a portion of that inheritance as an advancement, we have assurance that what we receive, receive now is part of what we will fully receive in the future. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. God gives us the Holy Spirit in our lives now as a down payment, an earnest money deposit, guaranteeing what we will receive when we die. The Holy Spirit, which believers receive, now begins the process of preparing the believer to receive their eternal, glorified physical body upon death. The Holy Spirit, which believers receive during their earthly life, partially reveals what believers will eventually receive in the fullness of God. Paul is writing that instead of pursuing earthly ambitions, a believer should look with confidence 
and hope toward the time that we will eventually be with the Lord. Yes, Paul is saying that death is something to look forward to instead of to be afraid of. So what we talked about is our bodies are temporary, but they're going to be replaced by an eternal physical body. And that the Holy Spirit gives us assurance. I guarantee that we're going to get that physical body. So what should this assurance do for the believer? What should it do for us? This assurance should give or should motivate believers to make the best use of their time on earth. Paul writes in verses 9 through 11, therefore, therefore always takes into account what we've previously said. And Paul is saying that we live in temporary bodies. We're going to get permanent bodies. And we got a guarantee of assurance that we're going to get them. So therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him, to Christ. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Knowing, therefore, the terror or fear of the Lord, we persuade men, but we all we are well known to God, and I also trust well known to your consciences. Paul wrote that this assurance of receiving a new physical, resurrected, glorified body is what motivated him to endure the persecution, suffering, and pain he experienced in preaching the gospel message. This assurance of receiving a new, permanent, glorified body motivated Paul to endure everything he suffered in this life. Paul never gave up preaching the gospel message because he knew what was awaiting for him when he died. To Paul, heaven was not a destination. It was a motivation for him to make the best use of his remaining time on earth. Paul enumerated three motivations that are contained in these verses. First, to live a life pleasing to Jesus. In verse 9, nine he says, Therefore, we make it our aim, our goal, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him, to Christ, to live our lives in a way that's pleasing to Jesus. This was Paul's highest goal. Paul was passionate to serve and please Jesus in the same manner as a servant seeks to serve his master, not to live for himself, but to live for his master. The second motivation was to live a life in anticipation of receiving eternal rewards when he appears before the bema, or judgment seat of the Lord, who will award eternal rewards for Paul's activities on earth, which are pleasing to the Lord. Believers will not face a punitive judgment, but instead will stand in front of the Lord to receive a crown of victory for what they had done during their lives that was pleasing to the Lord. In Roman cities, and especially in the city of Corinth, in the town square, there was a judgment seat or bema, where the governor or proconsul sat to render judgment or to give a crown of victory to the athlete that won the competition in the Isthmus Games. So the games are over, the victorious athletes come before the bema, and they're given a crown of lettuce that decayed, but they're given a reward for being the victor in the Isthmus Games. Well, this is what Paul is talking about. We're not going to stand in judgment for sin in front of the Lord when we die. Um, that judgment for sin was paid for by Christ and his death on the cross. And that sin no longer is, is tags along with us. When we appear before judgment, it's an evaluation judgment. It's an evaluation where lo the Lord looks at what we did, how we lived our life as a believer, and what we did that was pleasing to him, and, and, and that is a crown that we can lay down. Th this a lot of us think that, well, maybe we don't bring a whole lot of people to Christ. So we're not going to have much to be rewarded when we die. But I can tell you that there are prayer warriors in our group whose prayers are constantly before the Lord. Amen. And, that, and those are things that there are people that may not be able to go out and minister, but they donate money to minister. There are those that among us who encourage each other and encourage each other to do things and go on doing things that bring others to Christ. So there are a lot of different ways that we will be given rewards for what we do. And Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount 
said, when we pray, pray in secret. Don't pray in front of all the people because then you're going to get the reward of praise from the people who are listening to your prayers. And he says, and when you're doing something for the Lord, don't let your right hand know what the left hand's doing. In other words, there's a lot of things that all of us are doing in secret, in private. But God is aware of what we do as believers. And it's the Holy Spirit that draws us into doing things that are pleasing to the Lord. So Paul is writing that what believers do in their temporal bodies will have an impact in eternity. The sins of believers have been dealt with on the cross, but the worthwhile, eternally valuable activities of the believers during their lives will be praised and rewarded. Now, the third motivation that Paul has from the assurance that he is going to receive an eternal, resurrected, glorified body is to persuade men to accept his integrity in preaching the gospel so that the believers in Corinth would not defect from the gospel because of the false teachings they were receiving from others. In verse 11, Paul writes, Knowing therefore the terror, fear of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are well known to God, and I also trust are well known in your consciousness. At first blush, when you look at the scripture, you're thinking that he's motivated to preach the gospel to non-believers. But what Paul is really saying here in the context of what we've already studied is that he's been attacked for giving a false message, for acting in self-interest in giving the Corinthians the gospel. But he is saying that, you know, that therefore the terror, his terror or his fear of the Lord, his, and it's not a being afraid of the Lord, it's his knowledge of what the Lord has given us in mercy in terms of salvation and a resurrected body that we will persuade men, the Corinthians and other people we brought to Christ, that we are preaching with integrity and that the word we're preaching is true. And so Paul is saying our consciousness, like he said before, bear witness to the truth of what we're saying. So Paul is closing the door on these false teachers saying, we're conscious of our evaluation of what the judgment that God will give to us when we finish our walk on earth. And we preach the gospel with integrity. And so we we do, we live our lives, we preach the gospel with integrity to per persuade you that what we're preaching is true and what we're telling you is true. You are going to get resurrected bodies. There, you will receive eternal life and Christ has paid for your sins. And he's saying that we do this so that you will not be drawn away from the truth by the false teachers who are telling you otherwise. Paul recognized that he was accountable to God who called him to preach the gospel message. Paul's accountability to God motivated him to defend his own integrity in order to defend the truth of the gospel message he was preaching. Paul is saying that believers are held to account to God on how they use the time allotted to them on earth. Time spent in worldly pursuits will be burned up. Time spent pleasing God will be rewarded. In conclusion, every moment in our lives, every moment in time counts. If you don't believe that every moment counts, just ask a young person who is delayed starting school because he's a year younger than his friends or who has to wait one more year to get his driver's license. Or just ask a mother the significance of a month when her baby is born a month premature. Or just ask a lawyer who is one day late in filing a complaint and misses a statute of limitations. Or anyone how life changed after that one day on 9-11. Just ask a traveler who is one minute late and misses his flight, which departed exactly on time. Or just ask a driver who misses being involved in an accident because he delayed one second before entering an intersection where another driver ran a red light. Or just ask an Olympian champion about the importance of a fraction of a second, which made the difference between first and second place. Every moment in our lives counts. So with that, we're going to go into the discussion questions about these first 11 verses of chapter 5 of Paul's epistle to the Corinthians. From this lesson, we have the following implications, conclusions, and applications. Paul lived to please God, having confidence and assurance, I said insurance, assurance, that when he died, he would receive a new physical, glorious, and eternal body, 
which would replace the temporary tent he occupied on earth. Paul looked forward to his new life with the Lord, but devoted every remaining moment of his life on earth, preaching the gospel and sharing his faith with those who believed the new covenants of, of salvation. Every moment in Paul's life counted because Paul held himself accountable to God who called him to preach the gospel. Paul sets the example of how we should live out the remainder of our lives, making every moment count towards a pleasing God. How we live is not how we live it now is how we plan for what we will do and how we will live after our funeral is over. I've got a bunch of typos in there, but I can see that I attached the wrong sheet. Anyway, um, the point is, is that how we live now is how we plan for what we will do and how we will live after our funeral is over. And so that goes back to the subject of tonight's lesson is what are your plans are you making after your funeral? Amen. Amen. Very good.